It has to appear right away, I guess. Perfect. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm also super happy to be here today at this stage. And before we jump to this amazing topic, a few words about myself. Uh, I've been working in game dev for almost nine years since 2014, and I started my career as an environment concept artist uh, in a Ukrainian company named Frogverse. And after two years of working like as a concept artist, I switched to uh, city design for Actually, I forgot to, to switch the slide, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm super nervous always also with the hangover after yesterday party, so you know. Yeah, so co company Frogwares. And uh, uh, here is a few concept art of, uh, that I made there. And uh, after two years, I switched to uh, uh, city, uh, city design for open world game Sinking City. And that work includes creating some, some city layouts, architectural drawings, smooth concept, a lot of research. And uh, this work actually gave me some basic knowledge about urban planning in games. Uh, then I worked in uh, Frog Lab, also a well-known Ukrainian company, and it was uh, mostly it was pure concept art, uh, mostly environment, sometimes props. A few works of mine you can see on this slide. Uh, and uh, after almost five years working in relatively big companies, I switched to indie game development. And it's a well-known story, like uh, a small team of dreamers full of passion and hope. But unfortunately, 2020 hit us quite serious, so we never had a chance to release our project. However, we, I did a lot of stuff there, and honestly, it's even hard to say what, uh, what, kind of, what position I had there, because I did concept art, I did level arts and blockouts, I don't know, even assets, because you know, indie. And uh, after two years uh, there, I decided to give up concept art and switch completely to level art. And my, my next uh, job was Dragon's Lake Entertainment. Yeah, I was senior level artist there, but NDA is still valid, so let's move on. And now it's almost uh, a year that I've been working in CD Projekt Red as environment, as a senior, senior um, level artist. And uh, of course, I'm working on urban environment as well. But I must warn that my speech is not going to be about cyberpunk or any other CDPR project. And I really hope that no one is disappointed <laughs> because I'm going to speak about cities in general and also how to create your own city for your own game. So let's move on. And uh, first, why do I speak about city anyway? Uh, first, because uh, urban environment is really common in many video games. It can be either a real city or fictional, maybe like historical city, whatever. Still, it's an urban environment and we have to understand how to work with it. What's more, necessity to work with, uh, with the cities doesn't really, uh, doesn't really connect to uh, size of company and scale of the project. Uh, and I know it out of my own experience, because now I work in cyberpunk and it's a, like a huge city and yeah, lots of stuff uh, going on there. But also I used to work in a small indie team of five people and urban planning rules were basically the same. I mean, of course, it would be ridiculous to compare our project. But uh, my point is that what I'm going to say like in next hour or so <laughs> is that uh, it's valid both for uh, huge companies with AAA projects and for uh, sm uh, smaller scale projects. Um, and uh, another thing that I would like to highlight like in the very beginning is that like a uh, city is just a background for all events that happen in your game. Like good city is just a good city. I'm not going to say that city is the most important thing in a game. Like absolutely not. It doesn't guarantee you like a good game in the end of the day. Um, I would say that urban planning uh, for, for games is uh, the same as anatomy for character. Because when you create in a character, like you have to make it anatomically correct, but it doesn't guarantee you that this character will be great, right? Like you still have to think about uh, like, I don't know, design, clothes, also animation and stuff like that. Um, but if we uh, neglect anatomy when creating a character, we probably will fail. So the same works with the city. Uh, so how to move from real city to, to a game city? And um, 
let me say right away that we can't just uh, copy some layouts from Google Maps, even if we uh, try to create like real existing city, like it will, it will not work like that. Because like in case of design, basically like everything, environment, props, vehicles, whatever, we have to sometimes simplify, sometimes exaggerate, sometimes stylize. Same works with, uh, with the city. Uh, because like the main difference is that real cities were made for comfortable living, while game cities should be made for fun playing. And those are completely different tasks. And <laughs> I will start with how not to do, uh, because I know that this is a really common mistake uh, among many artists and designers, that um, they perceive a city as a bunch of buildings randomly thrown on a surface or, or on a terrain, doesn't matter. And it's really important to understand, and I even put it on a slide, I'd highlight it with this, with this green box, because it's super important that city is not a bunch of buildings randomly thrown on a surface. And um, I will explain this idea in a second with this uh, very let's say, schematic and general example. So here we have uh, two silhouettes, uh, almost identical uh, silhouettes of, of a city. And actually, I put those titles, correct city and incorrect city on purpose, because even for me, they look almost the same. And even I could actually, you know, forgot which one is what, even though I made it. And uh, in a second, you will understand why I named that they like that. Well, so I, th I, I really hope that now you more or less get my point. So, so uh, uh, on the top image, we can see this correct city, like a top view of this correct city, and we understand the structure. Like, of course, it's schematic, pretty simple, but we understand it because we s saw such structure like many times. And on the bottom image, we see this uh, bunch of buildings on a surface, basically a chaos. So, of course, this is not a city. Uh, while from uh, from silhouette perspective, it looks <laughs> more or less uh, like city. And now let's look uh, at these both examples from a street view, uh, the way that uh, we perceive uh, cities in real life and how player perceive cities from uh, first and third person games. So those are shots from so-called correct city. And uh, of course, here we can see uh, a lack of details because yeah, okay, basically it's just the gray cubes, but we can understand the space. So we understand that those are streets with some skyscrapers. We kind of understand that we can go along the street. Uh, maybe if we get to some crossroad, we can turn left or right. At some point, maybe we go to some square or some other place. If we go through the building, uh, we will get to a backyard or to another street. So actually, for space that made out, made of yeah, like great uh, great cubes, we can uh, read a lot of information, which is cool. And those are shots uh, from so-called incorrect city. And honestly, it's really hard to identify the space. Like, it's definitely not a street. I can't see a street here. Maybe it's a backyard, but I would say it's too, too uh, complicated for backyard. So long story short, this space is really hard to identify. Like, of course, as a small remark, I should mention that if we take uh, those cubes and uh, add some architecture, add some details, I don't know, like windows, also maybe some street furniture and stuff like that, maybe, probably, for a moment, we will uh, make a player believe that, that this is actually a city. But if we do so, we will get something like this. <laughs> And it's cringe. Um, so uh, to understand uh, how to how to build a city, uh, first we should understand what is a city and what is it made of. And we will go back to those cubes, but first I would like to throw a little bit of theory. So we can divide uh, urban space to four basic types. Uh, it's a street, a square, Backyard, uh, which means this uh, space inside the city block, and green zones, uh, which basically parks, I don't know, maybe rivers. And um, here I must say that first, uh, this uh, list is not like ultimate list of urban space, because in real cities we have uh, more types of, of space. For example, I don't know, for example, a parking lot. 
like parking lot is not a square also it's not really a part of street like it's just something separate uh, also we can have like free space because building was demolished so there are like empty lot it's also not a square but some kind of open spaces uh, also we may have uh, like industrial zones in our city and space works absolutely different there and i will say a few words about industrial zones a bit later and another thing that i should mention here is that this uh, division works for city block type of urban planning because also we have a super block type of urban planning and here i would like to stop and explain uh, so on the top we have uh, absolutely random examples from different cities of city blocks and uh, uh, from super blocks so uh, i'm pretty sure the difference is visible uh, on those shots but the idea is that city block it's uh, when we have um, like dense row of buildings along the street that actually creates those city blocks. They can be different shapes and different size, but still like uh, all of them are, su uh, are city blocks. And super blocks uh, is a, a super block is a separate standing buildings, usually uh, around some infrastructure unit. Like it may be like a school, kindergarten, maybe some such a social institution or something like that surrounded by trees and surrounded by big roads because there are no big roads inside the city block and the best example of uh, of super block uh, is this modernist or soviet urban planning and i'm pretty sure that you know what i'm talking about i believe that some of you even grown up in such environment so uh, in my speech i will focus more on city uh, city blocks type of urban planning First, because, well, I like it way more than super blocks. Uh, second, to not make it too complicated, because I'm sure that we can extrapolate uh, everything that I'm going to talk to super blocks. However, it's really big and complicated topic, and philosophical topic, why uh, city blocks are better for human perception than super blocks. So, once again, we we'll focus on city blocks. And a few words about industrial areas. Uh, so once again, like uh, space uh, in this uh, uh, in these areas was completely different because they were uh, built and formed uh, like not for, let's say, not for human, but for a certain production that, uh, that proceed <laughs> in those industrial zones. So this is not, not really a super blocks, not uh, definitely not a city block. So it's something completely different. And I'm saying, uh, I'm saying that uh, because this, um, uh, this division, uh, street, square, backyard and green zone doesn't really work for industrial zones. So just keep in mind that, like I said before, this is not an ultimate list. But those four types are most common, both for real cities and for game cities. That's why I really think that we should speak about it like more. And what is the main idea behind uh, having those uh, separate type of uh, urban, um, urban space? Like, if we imagine that we were teleported to a random city that we have never been before, or I don't know, wake up with terrible hangover and we don't remember where we are and why, and we're somewhere like outside, we will immediately identify the space around us. Like if we in the middle of the street, we understand it like immediately. If we are uh, in the middle of the square, we also understand it. And there is no chance that we confuse street and square. Like it's completely different, um, different space. And I believe that in game, uh, in any game, it should work the same. So if player are, uh, is uh, in the middle of the street, they should immediately understand it. Uh, so I have a few examples from real life and now let's go to examples from games. And this is an example from uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Uh, and well, this is a street <laughs> and honestly nothing to add. Like we can see a road, uh, we see uh, buildings so from on left on right. So kind of it's a street. Uh, here we have uh, uh, a backyard. I really hope it's visible. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is ki this kind of uh, closed uh, space that's surrounded by uh, by buildings, and we understand that uh, this is backyard because we can see those back facades uh, uh, like around us. So it's a backyard, and it's quite readable. 
And finally, this is an example uh, of, uh, this, uh, of the square, also from Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And we also can understand it quite easy because we see this, this uh, uh, huge space surrounded by buildings. And this time it's not back facade, but main facade. That's why we identify it as a square. Also, we can see this road which, uh, um, which goes through the square. Also, a lot of other streets that, goes to, uh, that go to different directions. So, uh, in this game, uh, this um, this division on different types of space works really uh, really good. Um, so, but it was exam example from open world game, and uh, of course when we work on open world, we really have to think about all those streets, how they connected, uh, like alternation of uh, um, streets and square and stuff like that. If we're creating a, a smaller game, like corridor type of game, so we show only some city locations, uh, we don't have to think about entire city structure, of course. So in this case, it probably would be enough just to make the space clear. So if it's street, then it's supposed to be immediately uh, readable, uh, read as a, as a street. And this example is from uh, The Last of Us Part 2, and we know that this is not an open world game, so we can see only some parts of some cities. And uh, on the slide, we see that actually this is a street, and even though it's like broken and overgrown with all those uh, uh, greens and stuff, we immediately understand that this is a street. So this is a really cool example. And finally, uh, if we want to create some background and the player will never go inside the space, then we actually can skip this uh, urban planning stage and not bother <laughs> to, to create uh, a city structure. Because uh, we already made sure, like a few slides before, that on the level of silhouette, there is no difference. So if you have to create only a background, you can just uh, place uh, buildings like, you know, to, to create some nice composition and that's it. Because no one will never uh, guess that uh, that city is incorrect. And this example is from Remember Me and actually, uh, we have sometimes we we, we see that uh, that skyscrapers in the background, and if I'm not mistaken, we never go inside uh, that area at least from from this foreground. So uh, honestly, I have no idea how correct those skyscrapers in the background from uh, urban planning perspective, and honestly, I don't care. Um, and a few words about level design, because uh, during my career, like several times, I dealt with this idea that having a street grid kind of um, kind of creates some restrictions for for uh, uh, level designers, like they have uh, less uh, less freedom to create their magic. And of course, I disagree with this because uh, having having a street grid actually first it can be a good uh, a good base for creating level design, and second, and which is really important, that um, street grid doesn't really oblige player to move only along the streets, because maybe uh, we can cross entire city in a straight line in. Um, any direction, uh, because uh, we can move, for example, like Spider-Man, yeah, we can just jump from, from building to building. So we, in this case, we don't really care uh, directions of the street. Or maybe, as I mentioned, Assassin's Creed, uh, maybe we can move like uh, Jacob or Evie, so we also can just jump on facades from roof to roof. So street direction in this case doesn't really matter. Or if uh, in our game we can move only like a normal human, uh, we also can move not only along the street, but also across. So we can move uh, and we can alternate our space with some interiors, go up and down inside the building, so create some, you know, verticality, which is also cool. And this example uh, is from Resident Evil 3. Uh, they actually have really nice city, not huge though. And uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you notice, but we almost never move along the streets. But uh, in, I don't know, 90% cases, we cross it, move from one building to another building. So once again, uh, street direction uh, doesn't oblige us to move uh, only along the street. Now let's go back to cubes. Uh, and those example, I, I want to show how um, how this uh, space works in very early stages. And actually, I took cubes on purpose, so, uh, so we are not distracted by some details, some architecture and stuff. So here we can work with pure space. 
So those are examples of uh, examples of three different streets. The first one it's like white street with skyscrapers, and yeah, I already showed this render before bef because I was too lazy to make another one. Excuse me for that. So uh, actually, quite a lot of information uh, for just you know for just gray cubes. So we understand that this is white white street with skyscrapers, like kind of ultimate description, I would say. The next one, um, top uh, right, is like a small alleyway. And I cheated here a bit because I had those cubes in the foreground, so we can read them as dumpsters or something like that. So it helps us to read uh, the scale, but still it's just the cubes, right? It's not real dumpsters. Um, and uh, here we immediately catch it as a small alleyway, which also kind of ultimate uh, description of the space. And the third one, uh, bottom left, is something like curvy street with uh, low rise or mid rise buildings, which also kind of ultimate description. Like we understand a lot about the space, not place, but space. This is important because we have no idea about the place. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, this is like the main thing here. And also I uh, give a few uh, uh, two examples of let's say open city space. Uh, it's a square and backyard. And I really hope that it's, uh, uh, that it's clear which one is what, but in case if not, uh, the top one is a square and bottom one is a backyard. And uh, we can read uh, the top image at the square because we have this huge empty, empty space surrounded by buildings. Maybe in the end of the day, it will not be that empty. Maybe we'll put some, I don't know, maybe a monument in the center, maybe some benches, maybe some trees, or maybe it's a place with heavy traffic. So we uh, will have like a lot of, you know, like street signs or something like that. But still we understand that this is a square also because we have like uh, a different streets that goes to this place or from this space or through this space. So uh, it can be read like uh, like square. And bottom image is a backyard, also surrounded by buildings. But what the main difference is that uh, to a backyard, we can go only if we go through the building or if we jump from the roof. Uh, also another option if uh, um, our row of buildings that creates the city block, maybe one buildings were demolished or uh, uh, wasn't built, then we can go through this empty lot and also get to this backyard. But thing is that we never have a street that goes directly to the backyard. So backyard, it's like kind of a side of uh, some streets. And usually backyards uh, uh, are filled with some um, some utilitarian structures can be garage, can be some storage uh, stuff uh, like sheds or whatever. Uh, sometimes trees. Sometimes if uh, if um, those backyards are big enough, uh, there can be like second or even third row of residential buildings. So uh, um, configuration, I don't know, of those backyards can be really different. Yeah, slide with a lot of text. Sorry, uh, and. Um, the main idea about having having this uh, this space, um, these cubes, and all, 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 all what I'm just saying is that is that urban planning uh, working on early ages of creation. So uh, we work only with cubes. We have like nothing but cubes, but we already understand the space. And if we take uh, if we take this um, this cubes. Uh, this base made of cubes and add some details, some, some architecture and stuff like that, we will get really uh, clear, readable, distinctive space, uh, which is actually our ultimate goal as uh, city designers. And once again, can we skip the stage and move directly to level design, then add some level art and some beauty, some magic and stuff, and just you know skip the stage? Absolutely, yes. And we have enough examples of such approach in, in existing games. But uh, like, it's, it's the same as with character. Like, uh, I will go back again to this comparison city and character. So uh, if our character uh, has some mistakes in anatomy, like non-artists probably will never guess what 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 uh, what the problem is like? Uh, he or she maybe intuitively understand that okay something is not right, but he or she will never point at exact problem like I don't know like cheekbones on the wrong position or elbows are lower than they should be or something like that. And with the city is the same. So player 
will intuitively understand that, okay, something is not right here. And honestly, in case of urban planning, we have even more opportunities to fool the player because adding some, some uh, decoration, like, yeah, really helps. But the question is, do we really want uh, spend, uh, waste our time on it? Do we really want to put so many efforts on deception to fool the player while we actually can use the same amount of resources to make everything correct from the very beginning? Do we really want to want waste our time and eventually get this? The answer is no. <laughs> so that's it for this pure theory. Now let's go to more practical part. So city creation pipeline. And the uh, first thing, and it's not going to be a surprise, that uh, city is heavily depends on gameplay and uh, to be more precise on type of movement and even speed of movement. Because this parameter is um, straightly connects to size, scale and level of detail. And now I will speak more about those three very important parameters. So first one is size. And uh, size is the most, the simplest parameter. So it's literally like square meters or square kilometers of our city. And uh, of course, like uh, having this number in the very beginning, it's really, it's something really approximate. Like we can't say that, okay, we have our city, like, I don't know, uh, three by four kilometers and that's it, like made in concrete. Absolutely not. So we have to, we have to, come up with some number just for, you know, for sake of having some base, so it's not something ultimate. And most likely uh, the size will be changing during production and it's okay. Um, what else about the size? Like uh, what is important to actually understand? Because for example, if we create a city like GTA 5, so where we mostly drive a car, this city probably will be bigger than city where we primarily move on foot. I mean, of course it's not necessary because maybe you have like 1000 level designers who are able to fill your gigantic city with some events and gigs and create like 1000 hours of gameplay, like who knows? But anyway, I guess you know, uh, you understood my point. So a uh, city for moving uh, on foot uh, can be, or maybe even should be smaller and more dense than city where we mostly driving because it should be like big enough for actually comfortable driving. And by the way, this background, uh, this map is from GTA 5 and I took it from this website, like in a corner, highly recommended because uh, in this site, th this website, they have a lot of uh, maps from uh, well-known open world games. And it's really useful for, you know, for some research for some stuff. So highly recommended this website, just, just you know, browse and, and you'll see. Uh, next parameter is a scale. And this parameter is about like uh, sizes of the street, like uh, widths and lengths, uh, sizes of city block, head of buildings and stuff like that. And at a starting point, uh, I decided to take <laughs> maximum, uh, maximum length of straight part of the road. And I believe it sounds a bit complicated, so I'll repeat it. So, maximum straight chunk of the road. So how long can we move on a straight line and feel okay? Because at some point it will be boring to move just straight, so we should turn left or right or something. And um, uh, this is not uh, like, uh, this number is also, first of course, it's uh, it's approximate number. And uh, it's, uh, it's not like one number for entire city because uh, it's more like a range than a number. Because for example, we can have uh, area in our city, I don't know, maybe like a business district where we have a skyscrapers and wide street. So in this area we'll have uh, one scale and maybe we have another area with uh, slums and curvy streets. So scale in this area will be different. So scale, it's more like range. And uh, I must say that uh, there is no formula how to understand uh, the scale, uh, how to define, I mean, the scale. So the only thing, the only way to define it is actually empirical way. So uh, build, test, throw away, repeat. And another uh, uh, next parameter is level of detail and uniqueness. So this is like full uh, title of this parameter. Uh, and basically it's about level of details, yeah. Um, it also depends on type of movement. 
because uh, if our game is about slow movement and uh, exploration, uh, then we have to focus more on like smallest details. So it would be interesting, you know, to to look around, to to I don't know, to explore basically. And uh, if uh, we move really fast in our game, in this case, we should focus more on medium and big volumes. And uh, here I have this example from uh, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. And if you play this game, you know that we move super fast there, like very fast. So um, creating those games, uh, Insomniac, they definitely focus more on those bigger scale uh, volumes because uh, in, in, like, in this case, in this type of movement, it's more important than having like, uh, I don't know, smaller uh, piece of trash uh, on, a, on a sidewalk. Um, so, uh, we, uh, we define approximate size, the size of our city, we more or less understand the scale of our city, we understood how detailized our city should be, and now let's speak about visual diversity of our city, because each city uh, doesn't look evenly the same, like we always have different areas, different districts, uh, maybe a poor or like and middle class and rich areas, also industrial zone that I already mentioned. Uh, and uh, of course, the same should be in game city. Um, and uh, here I suggest to uh, use this term neighborhood. So city, city is divided by neighborhoods and each neighborhood share same uh, appearance, same maybe atmosphere, same idea. And uh, talking more about those neighborhoods, uh, those are three uh, foundations that visual diversity is based on. It's layout, which actually means this uh, city planning, architecture and landmarks. And now I will talk more about those three parameters. The first one is layout. Uh, ideally, for each neighborhood, we should create its own uh, its own layout. And like, of course, it's uh, maybe maybe not possible to do it like completely completely unique. Because, for example, if uh, we have uh, I don't know like seven or eight neighborhoods in our city, I'm not really sure that it's possible to create seven or eight completely unique layouts. Uh, but uh, speaking of uniqueness, it's more about you know having some features. So. Uh, I will put it like that, as more uh, different those layouts will be, as better. And everything else, it depends on your resources and idea of your city, of course. And here I gave uh, three really very different types of layouts. And honestly, I'm not even sure if they fit in one city, because, you know, we still have to think about consistency, because we're creating only one city, so uh, every um, every element of the city should be, you know, should support uh, the idea of the city. And uh, but I really want to make this just to show the idea of this entire stage creating layout. So those are not like uh, finished game ready layouts like uh, for the game. Absolutely not. So those more like uh, research stage. And of course, uh, those layouts are super simple. So uh, here at this stage, we try to find an image of each neighborhood. So for example, if we talk about the, the one on the right, so we have this rectangular city blocks and here we can answer the question. Okay, so uh, does this rectangular, uh, rectangular plan actually fits our idea? Uh, do we like how we move here? Uh, do we like the street view that we see? Uh, the answer might be yes, might be not, of course, but also we can say that, okay, rectangular structures is okay, it really fits uh, our needs, but for example, um, streets are too wide. Like, let's keep it like that, but streets uh, should be, uh, should be uh, more narrow. Uh, or for example, okay, this idea is nice, but having nine uh, city blocks is too much, it, it looks just repetitive and boring, so let's keep only four, like for example. So uh, those are questions that we answer on the stage. And well, uh, the, same, the same for uh, other, uh, other type of layout. So here, in the middle one, we can say, okay, uh, we uh, love this, uh, this narrow curvy streets, but maybe we should reduce, I don't know, we should reduce uh, a blocks itself to have more space in backyard. So we have like this narrow streets, but pretty big and wide, uh, uh, backyard for some reason like I don't know it's just thoughts that came to my mind 
So this is for layout. Then we go to architecture. And again, ideally, each neighborhood should have its own architectural features and rules. But still, again, we should uh, remember about consistency. Um, and here I give uh, some examples. Once again, not an ultimate list, but just an examples of uh, architectural features, rules that we can use creating, uh, creating architecture for our neighborhoods. So it can be architectural styles. So each neighborhood has its own architectural style, kind, kind of clear, I guess. Um, materials. Uh, for materials, we can uh, see uh, this in, in this example, again, from Assassin's Creed Syndicate. So on top image, we have this uh, uh, old uh, lower class neighborhood and buildings are made of wood and plaster. And on the bottom image, we have this rich neighborhood and buildings mostly made of uh, stone and brick. So different materials, uh, different perception of neighborhood. Uh, then height. I guess it's clear. So we have a uh, neighborhood with, uh, for example, skyscrapers and neighborhood with low rise buildings or mid rise buildings. Uh, then uh, new and old buildings. Also, we can see it on this example. So top image, it's like old, more like medieval house. And uh, bottom image, it's like, well, for the time that, ha uh, that is in this game, it's like new building. Uh, poor and rich, basically the same. Ruin intact, I guess, also clear. So we can have, for example, neighborhood where buildings were ruined uh, for some reason, for example. Like I said, it's not an ultimate list because maybe this idea doesn't fit uh, our project, but just an example. And abandoned inhabited. And of course, this list can be continued like uh, with more bullet points. And uh, finally, landmarks. Uh, so once again, for each neighborhood, uh, we should create its own landmark or landmarks, uh, which became something like a symbol of this neighborhood. So I don't know, for example, for business district, it can be like a huge skyscraper or monument or whatever. Also, it can be a church because it's something like really noticeable and um, a separate standing building. Uh, for poor areas, it can be something, let's say, utilitarian, like maybe a chimney or or gasometer, like in this my old con concept made for the sinking city. So I created this huge gasometer, which was uh, visible from different point of views from this neighborhood and kind of explains uh, the atmosphere of this neighborhood. So uh, we already decided the size and scale and stuff from, for our city. We um, define how many neighborhoods we will have and what kind of features in terms of layout and architecture there will be. Also, we come up with landmarks. So now it's time to draw a street grid. And here are a few, a few tips for uh, street creation. First, and the, the most important one is references. And I even put it in caps lock because it's really important. We always should start with references. Uh, of course, it's easier when we create like real city. Uh, still, we can just copy past the layouts from Google Maps, like I said in the very beginning. But I mean, still, it, it's something like a base, so it's easier to, to, you know, to start with. But even if we create something completely fictional, I would su suggest uh, st uh, stick to some existing layouts. I mean, you know, just... Um, try to get some parts of different cities and create something something new and here i have this example this is my super old work for uh for sinking city and it was more like exercise i would say because i i took this uh, um this view from vienna and i attached uh this uh, satellite view uh, just to understand uh, the shape of the small square because it's really irregular, uh, irregular shape and i really like how it looks and how it feels so i i took this and uh, like photobashed for photobashed uh, different uh, different architecture basically like american this boston like new england architecture so i take this small piece of vienna put absolutely different architecture and basically it works like uh, no one uh, never ever would recognize Vienna uh, in this piece, right? Uh, so uh, in other case, it could be even, I don't know, maybe sci-fi, maybe some medieval stuff, like whatever. So uh, we still can use some existing layouts. So this is, this is uh, the idea of using references and maps. Uh, another advice, 
uh, walk along your streets. Like even if during the game you are not going to move along your streets because your gameplay is uh, like different, uh, still for the sake of city creation, uh, you should walk. Like imagine that you are a, uh, you are a tourist that you know just wandering around without any specific purpose, and I don't know and making photos like and answer the question do you really like what you see would you make a picture and i don't know post it to your instagram and the answer should be yes uh, also remember about alternation of open and closed space uh so i mean if, if we have like maze of uh, streets remember to have some maybe a square or some other open uh open space just you know to let player uh, rest a bit from this um, close, tiny uh, space. And uh, speaking of squares, uh, squares is really a good tool to cut some streets because if we have a relatively big street, I mean wide street, uh, we shouldn't cut it with just that end because uh, it will feel like, you know, artificial. So uh, Y street should always uh, be cut by uh, a square or by crossroad and divided to smaller street and smaller street can be cut just by that end. And speaking about big and wide streets, uh, think about having like a main street in your city. For smaller city, it can be one or two. For bigger city, we can have more main streets. So it's uh, a kind of arteria that goes through entire city. Like, uh, it doesn't have to be straight, but it should be like unbroken. So like a street that can connect different neighborhoods and different areas of the city. And uh, this example, actually, those, uh, those layouts are very, very early uh, stage of uh, sinking, uh, city for sinking city. Like uh, eventually in game, it looks completely different, but still like, uh, we can uh, see, we can look at those uh, those layouts. And uh, on that example, I had uh, like two main streets. So one uh, that goes uh, vertical, um, connects uh, almost all neighborhoods in the city. And also it connects, connects the, the main squares and landmark in the city. And this, uh, well, not horizontal, like diagonal street, uh, it kind of divides the uh, entire city to poor area on the south and middle class and richer area on the north. Uh, a few words about um, visual diversity of the streets. Honestly, it's a huge topic and I would love to speak more about this, but unfortunately we have some time restrictions. And also I would say it connects more to architecture than to urban planning, but still I have to say a few words about this. So we already spoke about the visual diversity of neighborhoods, but also streets, uh, they also do not look like the same, right? And here we have this uh, example from uh, from Budapest. Uh, like both streets are actually in the same neighborhood. They were built in same same time and shared more or less same architectural style. But uh, but we clearly see the difference in those two streets. And it's not only about the tweets, but widths of course as well. But the main difference here is function, because top street it's mostly like uh, residential buildings. And uh, well, yeah, basically residential, like uh, apartments, and that's it. And uh, bottom uh, image, this street is like mul um, multifunctional because I definitely see some shops, cafes, offices, also apartments. And uh, so function creates this visual diversity for the streets, and we should also keep it in mind. And another important thing is uh, terrain. Always remember about terrain, and this is why I would recommend to not stick. Uh, to not spend a lot of time on creating like 2D plans, but jump to 3D like as 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 early as possible, because uh, terrain really changed like everything. <laughs> and this example is from Valletta, Malta, because when I saw the plan of uh, Valletta, those rectangular um, street grid, I thought, okay, like rectangular plan. I saw it like many times, nothing special. Um, but when I when I see it like in my own eyes, I was absolutely surprised because Valletta was built on really high hills. And uh, when you go along the street, it feels like a roller coaster, like and views are just amazing. So, voila, <laughs> we kind of have our first um, 
for a city master plan. And of course, that's not like a solid structure that we have here, like, uh, because still it's going to be like iterative process, because as more you fill your city with some gameplay, as more you have to adjust, like everything. So it's kind of okay. But still, we already create some good base to, you know, to start with, to fill with gameplay, to create some level design and stuff. So let's summarize. Uh, a well-built city is important for further production, but it's not the most important thing in your game. Uh, city is a structure and rules and not just buildings on a surface. I really hope that I convinced you in this. Uh, there are four basic type, types of city space. It's a square, uh, it's a street, square, backyard and green zone. Uh, there are three basic parameters uh, of the city. It's a size, scale, and level of detail. And uh, there are three basic foundations of visual diversity. It's layout, architecture, and landmarks. And finally, believability of the city works the same as believability of characters, uh, creatures, weapons, and vehicles. And this is it. Thank you for listening. Maybe we have some time for questions. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, sure, we have 15 minutes for the Q&A session. So awesome. if anyone has any, uh, I'll just come to you and you can ask them right away. OK, thank you, Anya, for your presentation. That was really entertaining. And um, I have two questions, if that's OK. Sure. First of all, uh, you mentioned a couple of times that it's not a good idea to base your city on um, real life examples from Google Maps, for example, right? But can you elaborate what is what is the biggest problem of that? If I just take an actual plan, because I think a lot of real life planning went into real city and the streets and the squares are actually well planned in most of the cities. So what is the biggest problem of basing, having a baseline of virtual city on the real one? Uh, this is a cool question, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I think the main problem is uh, with sizes. Because for example, having 100 meters in real life, it's kind of okay. Uh, and for example, okay, maybe not 100 meters. For example, you have to cover distance uh, in one kilometer. In real life, you spend around 15 minutes to, to cover this distance. And in real life, it's okay. But if in game you will spend 15 minutes just to go from point A to point B, I mean, I think it will be the first and the last thing that you you done in this game, right? So, uh, of course, we can and we should use some existing layouts, but we have to uh, we have to adjust it to our game needs. Like, uh, because real city, if you try to uh, recreate the real city uh, in your game, uh, you will be surprised how actually huge it is, even for driving. Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken, but for example, uh, city for GTA 5 uh, was something like 5 kilometer by 5 kilometer. And uh, in game, that city felt huge, but in real life, 5 kilometer and 5 kilometer is kind of nothing. So, and uh, because you know, like real. Uh, Real Los Angeles is, I don't know, it, it, it's like, I don't know even how, what, 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 uh, what size is it, but I mean, it's huge. And I don't think uh, there is even resources to recreate such a big city. And like, there is no point to do it. Like, of course, we have to stylize, like, like simplify and, and, and stuff like that. So that's it. Okay, thank you. And the last question is uh, personally for you. If you could choose a virtual city to spend your life in, what would it be and why? Wow. Night City, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, I was curious about, you, you, you're talking uh, mostly about open world games, of course, because that's mostly what you've done. And I was curious because you, you mentioned sometimes in your workflow that you do the city planning and that's what you've been doing, I, I imagine. So I was curious about, when you work on an open world project, at what point and in which order do you do the city planning? Because obviously level design comes after that, I would imagine. Like you start by doing your city planning, then level design comes in and say, okay, here we're going to have this and that and this mission and stuff like that. And then you detail the blocks, right? Like could you go over the 
workflow? Uh, huh. Yeah, it's a tricky one to be honest because in different companies uh, they have like different pipelines. Uh, but yeah, creating a city is mostly like pre-production stage. So it goes before all, all level design and stuff like that. So first we, I mean, I don't know how to say it because honestly, I can't speak about pipelines and city projects. Sorry for that, but I'm not allowed to. So I will try to put it in like, you know, in general words. So yeah, in a stage of pre-production, we are uh, creating some, you know, mood concepts and also some some city layouts. And this is how we work actually in progress. Okay, I can I can speak about progress. Um, so uh, this this uh, city research sta stage took a lot of time because also it's not even about drawing layouts it's mostly about researching because uh, you have to understand why do you take particularly this part uh, this layout or that layout like it's not like just you know uh, something something spontaneous like absolutely not like I made a huge research on uh, uh, learning how cities in new, in new england were built when like what uh, what um, what affected those uh, those uh, city creation like how i mean a lot of features and i remember that around half year or maybe like five months i spent mostly uh, on creating you know pdf presentations instead of drawing and and uh, yeah and drawing so yeah th th this is like this is a huge research sta uh, stage because, okay, let, let, uh, I would put it like that. To draw a city plan, it's a matter of one day. But, the, the, but what goes before this actual drawing is a huge amount of work. And yeah, after that, we also we, we have like, yeah, level design, also maybe uh, some uh, concept art for like certain locations. Ah, and uh, another thing that I should mention that, for example, if we're talking about neighborhoods, like uh, me as a city designer, I honestly can't uh, suggest any neighborhoods. Like it's more about, it's more on narration, uh, you know, maybe level design and stuff. So, uh, so also that department works on idea of the city, idea of those neighborhoods, and I also have to gather all those info and create some magic. <laughs> but yeah, it's mostly like pre-production stage. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, so yeah, of course it's more like pre-pro work. Um, but what it is that you do then um, once the production has kicked in and you're like in the later stages, I would imagine like you go in pre-pro, you focus more on the CD, the themes, the districts and stuff. And as the production goes and the work goes forward, then I would imagine that you go into like a little smaller granularity and you do focus more on okay now we're building this district so you do those presentation that you mentioned like a bit of education with level design and artists and stuff right uh yeah yeah ideal ideally let's say yes <laughs> and yeah of course then i uh, i go to some uh, smaller scale parts for example also architecture because uh, here I, sp I spoke only about urban planning because again, like it's really, it would be hard to fit everything in one hour, but also architecture, the buildings itself, it's also a huge topic. And it's uh, also something that I usually work on. So after, after we have the city layout, then uh, we should focus on architecture. Well, not really after actually, it, 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 um, this work happens like at the same time more or less. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, okay. Hi, Hello. Anya. What was the most interesting project for you, and why? Well, Cyberpunk Night City, of course. <laughs> but like I said, I can't speak about this, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, honestly, like at the, uh, during all like nine years of my career, almost nine years, uh, like. Every every um, every period was interesting. Like for example, uh, my work in progress was just amazing. Like I would describe this this time like I don't know. It was like, you know, like first relationships, like ups and downs, like so many, so many cool stuff happened there. And I learned learned a lot of things. Like I mean, uh, it's really hard to uh, to underestimate uh, 
uh, that experience that I got there. Uh, also, my work uh, as an indie it was super interesting because I did a lot of stuff and I had an opportunity to try like different disciplines. It was super awesome and it's uh, really hard to achieve, you know, in bigger companies. Uh, now I work in like yeah in CDPR and it's also like amazing experience that it's really hard to compare with uh, what I what I experienced before. So, really tricky question. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, how you collaborate with uh, mission designers? Because um, when you have some um, level design lay layout, it could be uh, look uh, different uh, from the first your uh, first plan you you um, created. Quite quite often we fight. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, sometimes it's really hard to find common ground because sometimes uh, really like uh, art perspective kind of interfere with some, you know, gameplay perspective. And uh, uh, the best way is actually to be as as much open minded as possible to really. So we we have to put some efforts to find common ground. It's always possible. And it's uh, it really, it's uh, everything is about communication, about, uh, yeah, open-minded, about being uh, ready to, you know, to change your, to change your stuff, to, you know, to, to achieve maybe better results. But yeah, it's always a struggle. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Here. Hey. <laughs> so, I would like to ask you: Is there some uh, some some rules some rules for the cities from the future, far future, or far history? Like you must do that, or it's. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Like city, it's always about rules, and uh, the best part of this is actually you, the one who create those rules. <laughs> so, so yeah, like it's still about being consistent. So, for example, uh, if your future city, um, for example, you have flying cars. So you have to think about, okay, so I live in a city with flying cars, how it affects uh, the wall structure, maybe the height, maybe the, uh, the layout. So uh, you have to create those rules. Like uh, the, 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 those rules are, are not existing, like, you know, from the beginning. <laughs> that, that's why, of course, uh, having like fictional cities and future city, it's uh, way more difficult than working with, uh, uh, let's say, current time or with uh, some historical cities because we have way more references, you know, to work with. Something like that. Anybody else? Okay. Wow, so many questions. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think this is going to be the last one because we have like only two minutes left. So. Uh, so most of the cities you were talking were like modern or industrial. So do you have any experience in medieval cities and is there any difference in building it? Um, I think, uh, yeah, actually, uh, actually I have, but one I can't speak about because of NDA. Uh, and the most, uh, let's say, um, okay, I, I, I used to work with uh, Sinkin City and it's like 1920. So still it's like historical environment, not medieval, but still it's about working with past. Well, personally for me, it's way easier. Like I said, because uh, we have a lot of references uh, and uh, I mean, I mean, references in real life, because still, especially from 1920s, we have lots of photos, even movies. So for me, it's easier, it's easier to work with it. Also, well, I'm kind of nerd in this, uh, uh, in this field. So I really want to, you know, keep, uh, keep this historical stuff. So I'm trying to be as accurate as possible in terms of historical, uh, historical stuff. Uh, well, I mean, of course, still mm, like, to, uh, um, still remember about some gameplay needs because sometimes we don't we uh, don't have to be like we, we're not creating like historical panorama or something like that right so still some uh, some uh, uh, stuff we should skip and focus more on on game needs but yeah like uh, working on historical cities uh, it's also really cool and and fun time 
<laughs> yeah, thanks again, Anya. It was an awesome talk. Uh, please um, give a round of applause to Anya. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and we will be moving to our next presentation in just a few minutes.